Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Nardone. I'm director and co-founder of Biotrack. Welcome to our Thursday weekly webinar series. I've asked that questions be submitted in the Q&A box as they will be addressed at the end of the pre presentation as time permits. For those who aren't familiar with our program, Biotrack offers hands-on training workshops for research scientists. These workshops, which are team taught by active researchers, focus on the latest relevant techniques that are necessary for laboratory research. Originally based at the National Institutes of Health for 30 years, Biotrack is now located on the Montgomery College Germantown campus in the Bioscience Education Center. And these workshops are open to the scientific community. Since the program's inception, we have provided hands-on training to over 17,000 scientists. Along with our hands-on training workshops, we continue to serve the scientific community by offering bio panels, custom designed training workshops, weekly webinar series, hosting government and industry retreats and symposiums, as well as other key scientific events and outreach initiatives, such as the Maryland Science, Science Olympiad. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Christine Bursick. Dr. Bursick is a principal scientist at Momentus, the organ on a chip company in Gaithersburg, Maryland. She received her PhD in toxicology from Rutgers University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. In her training, Kristen utilized various model systems to characterize the negative impact of drugs and environmental chemicals on reproduction and development. In her role at Momentus, Kristen drives the development of innovative 3D in vitro organotypic models and assays. Her research is centered on recapitulating the liver microenvironment using iPSC-derived hepatocytes to aid in the accurate prediction of safe and effective candidate compounds. As director of Biotrack, I've had the pleasure of working with Kristen now for a few years as she is a key contributor to our hepatocyte training workshop. This workshop has provided hands-on training for research scientists from local, national, and international institutions. So without further pause, Dr. Kristen Bursak, modeling the prostate tumor microenvironment using organ on the chip technology. Kristen, they're all yours. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me to present today. I really, I always enjoy working with you and meeting and chatting with all of the Biotrack scientists. Um, so thank you again. Um, and I think while right now we may be in a little bit uncertain times, it's been really so wonderful seeing the scientific community coming together and coming up with new ways of communicating and sharing information like through these webinars. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this. Okay, so as Mark mentioned, Memetis is the organ on a chip company. We have offices located in the Netherlands, in Japan, as well as Gaithersburg, Maryland, and that's where I'm based. And together, our laboratories use biology-inspired engineering to develop 3D cell culture models of organs. And that includes the prostate tumor microenvironment. Um, and while I'll be using prostate cancer sort of as an example, I think many of the things that we're going to discuss today can actually be applied to some, of, some other tumor types as well. So before we jump in, I thought we might take this opportunity to introduce some key words and definitions. Um, some of these terms in the field are often used interchangeably, so I thought I'd introduce them so that we're all on the same page. The first being the general term 3D cell culture. So 3D cell culture refers to cells that are cultured in vitro that are sometimes supported by extracellular matrices or ECM. And this 3D culture can incorporate just a single cell type or, or it can use multiple cell types. And it can have, it can be static or it can incorporate what we call a blood flow mimic or perfusion. And it's those 3D cell cultures that incorporate a blood flow mimic that are considered to be microphysiological systems. So microphysiological systems, um, in addition to incorporating perfusion, they also have a component of uh, microfluidic channels. So these are micro-sized channels um, where we can actually culture our cells to be able to mimic the structure and function of organs and tumors. And type of microphysiological systems is something called tissue chips, which is synonymous with the term organ on a chip. 
And so moving forward, I'm gonna do my best to use the term organ on a chip, but if I use any of these other terms, hopefully um, be on the same page. So the current gold standard in cancer biology research, we know is 2D cell culture and animal models. And they often fail to recapitulate what's truly going on in the human body. And this creates sort of a gap between the two. And we know that 2D cell culture, often using cell lines, sort of lacks many of those components that are present in the tumor microenvironment. And this may contribute to the lack of concordance. So this includes things like extracellular matrix, which we know contributes to cell binding points for cells, as well as supporting 3D structure. Um, things like perfusion, which are present in the tumor but not in 2D culture. Tumor heterogeneity is often not captured with cell lines. And of course, we know in the tumor there are other cell types present there besides tumor cells. We have endothelial cells, there's also cancer-associated fibroblasts, and various types of immune cells. And I think while um, patient-derived xenograph uh, mouse model, where we can actually implant a human tumor um, into a mouse model, may address some of these drawbacks, I think it comes with some of its own limitations. Um, and that includes you know, being high cost, being relatively low throughput. Um, it's also lacking any of the human stromal um, signaling, which is important in the tumor microenvironment. Um, we're also lacking an immune system there because these, immune, these mice are immunocompromised and unable to um, incorporate the immune system. And so over the last 20 years, a large body of literature has suggested that 3D cell culture, which incorporates um, you know, vascularization, perfusion, co-culture with a number of different cell types, as well as being of human origin, may help to close this gap and provide a platform that better predicts um, say, um, efficacy of, of drugs or better models the, the mechanisms and underlying components of tumor genesis. So at Memetis, we've developed a platform that helps to bridge this gap, and that's called the organoplate. So the organoplate from the top of the plate, and I will we'll grab my pointer here if I can do that. There we go. So from the top of the organoplate, it looks like a standard microtiter 384 well plate. However, the bottom is a little bit different. We have here two layers of microscope quality glass, and in between the glass are microfluidic channels. And so you can actually use a pipette to add your cells, your extracellular matrix gel, and media to be able to build your stratified tissues layer by layer. And this two-lane organoplate has up to 96 individual tissue chips on the organoplate. So if we go ahead and zoom in on one of those tissue chips, we see that four wells in a row actually connect to make a single tissue chip. And the first well is the gel inlet. And this is where you can pipette in your extracellular matrix gel, collagen, matrix gel, with or without cells, in the case of our prostate tumor model, we incorporate prostate cancer cells here. And capillary forces actually fill that microfluidic channel. Once the gel has solidified, um, we can add media to the perfusion inlet and outlets. And capillary forces, too, fill that channel. And then the third well is the observation window. And this is where we can use, through the bottom of the plate, we can actually image um, the miniature cultures, um, sort of one by one. And I would say this may be your most important part of the culture because this is where your two microfluidic channels are actually interfacing with one another. And so it's also important to point out that our, there is no physical barrier that separates the gel channel from the perfusion channel. So instead, there's something called a phase guide, 
And this is a short ridge of plastic that runs in between the, the gel channel and the perfusion channel. And so when you pipette in your liquid extracellular matrix, the phase guide together with the wall of the perfusion channel or the gel channel actually acts to pin using capillary forces and actually pins the collagen or matrogel within that extracellular matrix channel. And then once it solidifies, we're free to add medium to the perfusion channel. And then the medium there can be in direct contact with the gel channel. So in the next slide, I have a video that will give you a little bit of a better idea of this, I think. And it will show you how a scientist may actually use the organoplate. So those are all the components we introduced earlier. And now we have a scientist using a repeat pipetter to fill the gel channel with extracellular matrix here in red and capillary forces are pulling that into the gel channel. And we also have cells mixed within the extracellular matrix gel. And we'll pause here just on the cross section of a single tissue chip. And we can see that our extracellular matrix gel with cells are present in the gel channel. And you have here this short ridge of plastic, our phase guide. And you can see the phase guide is, it's about a fifth of the height of the channel. So the remainder of the height of the channel is actually in complete contact with the perfusion channel. However, it remains completely within that gel channel. And so once the gel solidifies, we can actually add media to the perfusion channel. And that will fill by capillary forces as well. And then we can place the plate on our perfusion rocking platform and we can achieve perfusion so that the media in the perfusion channel actually provides nutrients for the cells that are present in the extracellular matrix gel with cells. So we achieve perfusion using a rocking platform. And so the media inlet and outlet wells act as media reservoirs. So once we're done preparing our cells in ECM, we can add 50 microliters of media to the inlet, 50 microliters of media to the outlet. Place the plate on the rocker system, which is inside of the incubator, and the rocker is then programmed to rock at a certain angle as well as a certain time. And every time that the rocker rocks, media will actually flow through from one reservoir well through the microfluidic channel to the other reservoir well. And that provides flow within the miniature culture. And then the rocker is programmed to rock back the other way and the media will flow again through the culture, providing a continual perfusion for the cultures within the plate. So in addition to being able to seed cells within an extracellular matrix gel, we're also able to seed cells against the extracellular matrix gel in that perfusion channel, which may mimic things like a blood vessel or barrier tissues like kidney or gut. So in this case, what we do is add, say, an extracellular matrix gel, let it solidify, and then you can add your media with cells to the perfusion channel. And in the video coming up, we'll show you a little bit of a depiction of that. So here we already added our ECM in red, and now we have our cells in the media. And once we've added those, we actually turn the plate so that the cells are able to settle on the extracellular matrix gel directly. And then once we begin perfusion, this promotes proliferation and the formation of a 3D structure within that perfusion channel. So we can actually form sort of a blood vessel mimic within that perfusion channel and media is still able to wash through. So there's a number of different culture configurations we can achieve in the organoplate. We discussed already um, in our two lane that you can seed cells in a gel, we can seed cells against a gel, 
But as you can imagine, if you want to introduce complexity and have multiple cell types in your culture, you can seed cells both in a gel and against a gel. So for a cancer model, this may include embedding your cancer cells in an extracellular matrix gel, and then having an endothelial cell blood vessel mimic in the perfusion channel. We also have three-lane organoplate where we can introduce even more complexity to our culture. And so the three-lane is different from the two-lane in that it has one additional lane um, or microfluidic channel sort of in, all in parallel. Um, and in this case, I think the, the configurations are, are many more. Um, and you know, a good example is over here on the bottom right-hand side. Let's say you have a blood vessel over here on your left, maybe some fibroblasts and mucosal cells sort of embedded in an ECM in the middle. And then you can imagine intest maybe an intestinal tubule over here on the right-hand side. Um, and maybe you could measure um, the, the absorption of compounds from the gut into the blood or something like that. Um, another configuration over here on the bottom left, you can also have two extracellular matrix channels directly next to one another. Um, and so that the media that flows in this one perfusion channel is able to provide nutrients for the cells in both um, extracellular matrix channels. And so this will come a little bit into play later uh, when we discuss the prostate cancer complex um, uh, model system. So we know that the tumor microenvironment, even the prostate cancer microenvironment, is very complex. There's multiple cell types there. We have our tumor cells, our cancer-associated fibroblasts, endothelial cells, immune cells, and they all kind of work together and um, are signaling to one another by receptor signaling and then small molecule signaling. Um, and sort of what's not exactly captured in this picture too is a heterogeneity in the tumor cells themselves. So it's very complex and something that um, a 2D cell line is, is not always able to address. Um, and so recently, uh, Mimetis was awarded a small business research grant by the National Cancer Institute to develop a prostate cancer on a chip model to better model this prostate tumor microenvironment. And we've, we've been doing so for the past two years and working very closely with um, some collaborators and experts in the prostate cancer field at the University of Texas, um, at MD Anderson, and at the City of Hope. So now I'm gonna walk you through a little bit how our journey of developing the prostate cancer on a chip model. Um, and just want you to keep in mind, if you're developing any organ on a chip model, any tumor on a chip model, these are many of the things that, that you kind of want to consider um, when you're building your culture. So the first thing you want to do is your tissue selection. And we know this is prostate cancer. And the next is the cell source. So for us, we, we were attracted by the, the prostate cancer PDX model. Um, the heterogeneity of the sources there, the possibility of modeling multiple, you know, different patients um, was attractive to us and we felt this is kind of the future for, for prostate cancer models. Um, however, we know that prostate cancer PDX cells are notoriously difficult to grow in two dimensions. Um, and so while we were kind of optimizing the PDX models, we wanted to take along with us a prostate cancer cell line that is um, very robust, reproducible, easy to work with um, first and kind of work out the kinks with that cell line before sort of translating um, what we've learned from the cell line to the PDX cell model. The next is the tissue complexity. So we decided, decided to start very simple um, and I definitely recommend this kind of start with a monoculture. I know it's not super exciting, but then you, once you are comfortable working with that monoculture, you can kind of build your other cell types into the culture. And we chose to do this because it's simple in the two-lane organoplate, also because that gave us you know, 96 chips on a single plate. 
We decided to seed the cells in gel. We felt that um, seeding the prostate cancer cells in a gel sort of best mimics how the cells, prostate tumor cells, cluster in an in vivo tumor. We chose an extracellular matrix um, that is also present in the tumor microenvironment, and that is hyaluronic acid. And for the medium composition, we just kind of use standard known medium conditions, as well as the flow settings. Our standard settings are a seven degree angle, rocking every eight minutes on our perfusion rocker. And for our readout assays, we chose to use an image-based viability assay um, to kind of take advantage of the, um, the imaging capabilities of the organoplate. And so most of the work I'll present sort of moving forward was actually performed by Lindsay Sablatora as part of her PhD research um, at the University of Texas. And so what we found when we put the cell line into the organoplate is that they were robust and quite viable um, on day one of culture, which was great. And so what we see here on the right hand, upper right hand corner, um, is we're zoomed in on that gel channel and we can see the prostate cancer cells here. We used a vi viability dyes to be able to identify whether the cells, the health of the cells, how they were doing. So we used host to stain all the nuclei, that's in blue. Propidium iodide to stain all the dead cells, those are in red. Oops, I apologize. Um, and then we use calcium AM to stain, stain all of the live cells and those can be found in green. And you can see there's very few red dead cells. So these, this culture looks great. They're starting to form sort of these mini clusters. Um, they're looking very healthy. So we took many of the same conditions and applied them to the prostate cancer PDX cell. And we found different results. Um, you can see in this first day of culture with this PDX line that um, we have many single cells that are actually dead. However, what's important to note is that there are quite a few, there's a few um, clusters of cells, those are the green ones, that are actually viable. So it's suggesting that this cluster morphology is actually ideal for the PDX cells. And we know that, we know that they, they really like their cell-to-cell -cell interactions um, to be able to be a, a viable cluster. So we put our thinking caps on um, and tried to figure out a way to separate out those viable um, prostate cancer PDX clusters away from those dead single cells because we were kind of worried those dead single cells might um, negatively impact the, the viable cells in the culture. So um, we worked closely with our folks at the University of Texas and we developed this method um, where we actually took the PDX tumor and dissociated it and were able to cluster them um, by using rotation culture. So we, we put them in rotation culture and what happens there is any of the mouse stromal cells will actually settle away and um, away from the tumor cells while the tumor cells will cluster and stay in the supernatant of the rotation culture. So then we could take those clusters and actually use a centrifugation gradient with Percol and separate out the various sizes of clusters. That way we can get rid of any of the clusters that are too big, any of those dead single cells, and we can zone in on a fraction of viable PDX clusters that are a good size for adding to the organoplate. And that was in our fraction three. And so we can then take those clusters, resuspend them in gel, and then dispense them into the organoplate. And so here we have a comparison of the unseparated and our percol separated cells. You've already seen this image of the unseparated, but you can see there's quite a drastic difference of those PDX clusters that were separated. And when we actually quantify the number of total dead cells, we can see there's much fewer dead cells in our separated culture. However, the cluster size remains the same between the unseparated and separated cultures.
Now, over the course of seven days, we track the viability of the culture. And we can see that the separated culture maintained high viability across the seven days, while we know that on day one, that the unseparated culture had much lower viability. Um, and this, this did manage to actually increase over time, but that's only because after day one, I think those dead cells act deteriorate and they no longer contribute to the population of cells and cell viability. It is important to keep in mind that um, we did the total number of live cells in the culture was much higher in the separated um, in the separated cultures as compared to the unseparated, really making an argument for using that per call separation method before culturing our prostate cancer PDXs. Okay, so now that we're comfortable using um, cell line as well as the PDXs in the organoplate, we wanted to address what is the optimal seeding density? How do we best mimic um, you know, what's going on in the tumor microenvironment? And we can do that by evaluating the proliferation of the tumor cells over time. And so for each of the cell lines, or the cell line and the PDX line, we actually used various seeding densities. And what we found for both the cell line and the PDX is that the 5,000 cells per microliter leads to um, you know, a greater proliferative capacity over seven days as compared to the other cell densities. Now to decide which of those is optimal, I think is really up to you and what you're most interested in modeling. So for example, if you were interested in understanding how a drug that you know affects, might affect proliferation of the cancer line, you would definitely want a density that promotes proliferation over time in your culture. But if you're more interested in studying, say, a more stable um, tumor microenvironment, then perhaps you might use the higher density cell lines. So now that seeding density is determined, the next thing you want to do is show that your phenotype is truly prostate cancer. You know, we've taken these cells we've manipulated them, we've added them to the culture, do they still express those markers that are present in the in vivo tumor? And we can do this using immunofluorescence staining. Um, and we know two markers of, of some prostate cancers are prostate-specific antigen as well as the androgen receptor. And both of these were present in the cell line, um, which is important because when we go back into the literature, we see that the original tumor um, where the cell, line, the cell line was derived also is positive for PSA and AR. So we, um, you know, we're, we're getting closer, we're maintaining that prostate cancer phenotype. And interestingly, the PDX line was negative for both PSA and AR. But this is what we expected because we go back to the original patient tumor and we see that they were PSA negative and AR positive suggesting that we're, we're mimicking the, the prostate cancer phenotype in the organoplate. So now that we've fully developed our monoculture, we wanna start adding some of that complexity, some of those cells that I mentioned that are also there. So using the three-lane organoplate, we decided to embed our prostate cancer cells in an extracellular matrix, kind of using what we learned from the monoculture embedding those in this back channel, and then alongside them having in their own ECM, cancer-associated fibroblasts, and then in the final perfusion channel, having an endothelial blood vessel present there. And so this took, this took a little bit of, of optimization with media and different cell densities, but we were able to successfully culture together our cancer cells, our fibroblasts, as well as our endothelial cells. And what you can see over time is the endothelial cells will proliferate to a point where they form a tubule-like structure. So we can actually image the culture in multiple Z-planes throughout the height of the channel, stitch them together, and you can see in this 3D reconstruction, sort of in a cross-section, that we have a nice blood vessel-like mimic. 
So I think there's a number of different applications for prostate cancer or tumors on a chip. Um, and probably one that, that comes to mind most frequently is um, efficacy studies or dose response studies where you may, you know, early on in the drug development pipeline, say apply a library of compounds to understand how that may be effective in treating your cancer. I think it's important to note that right now the gold standard in that space is 2D cell culture. And before we, we all kind of jump to 3Ds better, I think we, we really need to do a comparison and show that three-dimensional culture, these organs on a chips are actually more um, representative and predictive than the 2D cultures. I think it's an opportunity to study, you know, the complex multicellular, multicellular mechanistic interactions going on between all of the cell types present there. That's, that's really not present in 2D culture. And we can do this in, in relatively high throughput. And I didn't touch on it much today. We are working on this at Memetis, but we, um, this is an opportunity to study the involvement of the immune system. And you can imagine that maybe even if you're using a PDX model that you collected from a patient recently, you may even be able to have patient-matched immune cells and understand how immunotherapies may um, treat any of those cancers. Addition, in addition to you know, those prostate cancer PDXs um, offering you know, tumor heterogeneity, I think we didn't touch much on the fact that I think it offers the opportunity to study you know, patient population heterogeneity. We can collect PDXs from multiple different populations and kind of evaluate um, maybe personalized medicine strategies for a particular population. Um, and I think a, a really important example of this is uh, cancer health disparities. And this is the case for prostate cancer as African-American men are um, experienced prostate cancer and have higher death rates, about two times higher than any other race or ethnicity. So I think this is an opportunity to kind of understand um, within different races and ethnicities, the underlying biological mechanisms and whether there's drugs that may be more appropriate for particular populations. And with that, I would like to thank all of my colleagues at Memetis, um, a really great international crew to work with. And then our folks at the University of Texas, especially Lindsay and Dan, who developed much of the data presented here. Our folks at MD Anderson, Dr. Nora Navone, was gracious enough to provide us with the PDX samples. And um, Rick Kittles at the City of Hope is helping us to genetically um, analyze our prostate cancer PDXs. With that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Kristen, thank you so much. We do have a question in the Q&A. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, we've got a couple now, here we go. Uh, how do you change or replace media in these plates? Great question. Um, so because the, res the media reservoirs are, um, they, because the inlets and outlets are reservoirs, you can actually use, um, you know, just a reg standard suction within your micro, um, Vacuum. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, so you can use, you can just use a vacuum to sort of suction out the media. And what I like to do is use a multi-channel repeat pipetter um, to kind of add the media back. Okay, next question. And a person thanking you for a great talk. Uh, are these uh, tissues on a chip also compatible with high, can, high content imaging systems and RNA-seq analysis? Excellent question, and I'm sorry I didn't address that earlier, but yes, I think that's one of the advantages of the micro titer plate platform is that we're compatible with many of the high content imagers out there already. Um, and for RNA-seq, certainly we have protocols where you can, um, you know, after you've cultured, lice your cells and collect the RNA and be able to, to perform that. And a follow-up to that, uh, you mentioned in the system that it can be applied to also develop the barrier system like kidney or placenta. Can a brain barrier model uh, be also created with the system with co-culturing endothelial cells or uh, glial cells? And if so, does it reach the uh, tight junction characteristic of the blood-brain barrier? 
Excellent question. So we do have a blood brain barrier model. I cannot say I'm an expert on that. Um, we do have a paper out there, so it's definitely worthwhile checking that out on PubMed um, just to see how close we're getting. I know we're continually working to be able to get um, close to in vivo function. Um, and we've recently developed a tier device actually that you can apply to the entire plate. So basically you put it on like a lid and it's able to measure the tier across all of your cultures at one time. Perhaps if you have that uh, a link to that uh, paper, I can forward it to the group uh, when they get the information next week uh, regarding the video link and also the handout. Last question, uh, how often does the media need to be changed? So I think it depends a little bit on your, your organ type. For this prostate cancer cells, we're changing every two or three days, kind of standard 48 hours, and then we'll kind of let it go over the weekend. Um, but it depends if, if the culture is more needy. So like our liver cells, sometimes they require being changed every day. Um, so it's just a little bit of an optimization, I think. Two more came in and then we'll stop there. Uh, how reproducible are the chips, uh, percent CV? Oh gosh, I can get back to you with that too. And maybe you can share that with them, Mark. Um, what they are, they are incredibly reproducible. Um, at least in my own hands, but I can't say I have generated value, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that. All right, and last but least, uh, can the system reconstitute immune system from tumor rather than co-culture with matched uh, patient? Yes, I believe so. I don't have the details on that. Um, okay. All right, why don't we uh, go ahead and stop there. Again, Kristen, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you everyone for attending today's event. Uh, as I just mentioned, next Tuesday, you'll receive further information from me regarding the recording of today's event, as well as uh, a PDF of today's presentation. Next week, the uh, presentation webinar will be given by Dr. Michael Sirachi from AstraZeneca. And the focus is on validation of multiplex amelofluorescence, staining imaging and imaging analysis. Uh, a, note, uh, a note about uh, Michael, he's co-chair of our annual uh, uh, multiplexing immuno-oncology symposium and workshop. Last year, we had over 100 people, and uh, unfortunately, we had to postpone the September event because of the pandemic, but is now scheduled for uh, March 9th through the 12th. So look for further information, and again, that'll be discussed next week. Again, thank you everyone for being a part of it and uh, enjoy the day and be safe. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.